Rabbi Yeshira Tzaitlin is a Lubavitcher chassid who lived in Montreal, who passed away uh, a little more than 20 years ago. Chassidim called him Rabbi Heschel. He was a Hasidish Ayyid, he was a very warm, passionate, serious chassid. And uh, in a way, he was like from the earlier generation. And he worried about such things as Emes, as doing things for the right purposes, for ideal reasons. So his son, Rabban Lazer, who was the Rebbe Shliach in Svas, tells a story about how once on a Simchas when he was a boy, his Rebbe says to his son, his father says to him, Kum, we're gain some Rebbe. We're going to go to the Rebbe. Rabbi Yeshua Tzaitlin had had a considerable amount of Lachayim. It was after all Simchas And they followed the Rebbe upstairs. And the Rebbe went into his room after davening, which is probably around a quarter to three. And he followed the Rebbe into his room. The Rebbe turns around and he sees that he's got company and he gave, gives him a, a million dollar smile and says to him, Rebbe Shua, what do you want? So he tells the Rebbe, Ich will dienen dem Ebishten mit chotcha bissele emes. I want to serve God at least with a bit, a bissele, a little truth. And he bursts into tears and he starts to sob. His son, Aaron Lazen, who was probably less than 10, couldn't understand why his father was so emotional, what he could possibly be crying about so passionately, so intensely. Because at that age, it was hard for him to understand the meaning of the word emes and the pursuit of it and the obsession for it. We are servants of God. We worship God. We serve God. We do what God wants. And naturally, obviously, there's a lot of different types of servants of God. There are as many different methods of service and servant as there are individual people. The Alter Rebbe calls it Hanistaris. When it comes to the spiritual dimension of Judaism, he writes in the introduction to the Tanya, and it appears again at the end, of, in the beginning of chapter 50, 44, Memdalad, that there are as many distinctive ways of serving God as there are individuals. And certainly one ideal that is, uh, so to speak, at the high end or the spiritual pursuit is the, the, the desire for the truth, to serve God because He's true, because He's real, because He's the real deal. And we want a connection to the Emes, because in our relationship with the Emes, we ourselves have a connection to truth. Rabbanan Strasheler, a great Gon and a great Chosid and a big Tzaddik, was, is considered by the Beis Rebbe the greatest of the Alter Rebbe's Talmidim, came to the Alter Rebbe in Lojne as a 14-year-old, and he had a yechidus, he had a private audience with the Alter Rebbe. And he wrote a little note, as was the custom when you go into yechidus, and the note said, quote, Hanefesh hashfeila b'yemes eich yiskadav ala ein sof. A truly lowly soul, how can it approach the ein sof? The Alter Rebbe got so excited, he took the note, and he ran out of the yechidus and left Rav Adam standing there. And he said to the Hasidim standing in the room outside, that Hasidim used to call, the Ganed Natachten, Behold, a boy came and asked a question that none of you thought to ask. What's unusual about the question is that it's very ideal. The aspiration, the wish, the hope that this question indicates is a desire to have a connection to the truth. Uh, in the Hayyim Yoyim it's brought, for example, that when the Alter Rebbe introduced Hasidus Chabad, he made Emes the pursuit of the truth, a priority. There's an expression that, yom yom that says, in effect, nisht az davzayn met an emes, nor emes alein is an avoide, which means it's not only that you do what you do in truth, but the truth itself is the service, or is, is a, a method of service. And it says in the yom yom, had the Alter Rebbe not insisted on emes to the degree that he did, he would have thousands of more chasidim. We have a maimed in front of us, which we're about to learn, of course, with the help of God. This maimed is a strictly avoid a maimed. This maimed talks straight to the heart. Not that it talks to the heart as opposed to the mind, but it talks to the person as opposed to the intellectual. In other words, this maimed is strictly about how we do what we do in order to have a relationship with Hashem. Not a relationship with Hashem that's about reciprocity, in other words, I be good so you treat me good. I'll be righteous so you don't make me suffer. But where the reward for the service of God is the service of God itself, which is, in the most basic 
sense, emes. And this maimer, which is based around the posik in our pasha, pasha's mishpatim, interprets the words of this particular posik in entirely spiritual sense. In other words, in no way is our interpretation consistent or the same as the literal interpretation. The literal interpretation is about God giving us the material blessings about children. The Maimed interprets this Pasuk in entirely metaphysical terms um, as a way of enlightening what Avodah Hashem needs to be or what we need to do in order to serve Hashem and specifically to serve Hashem, as they say, mitanemis, for the sake of truth, for the sake of the service itself. And most fundamentally, if a person is going to serve God and have a relationship with God, on a level or in a context where the reward for the service is the service itself, and the point of the service is the service itself, they must understand one thing fundamentally. Whatever spiritual success we have is generated by the power given to us by our Creator. In other words, our relationship with God is not even our own. Our relationship with God is God's gift to us because of our desire and our pursuit. And the argument of this moment fundamentally is that a person who thinks they'll have a relationship with God or a relationship with the truth through their own efforts, it's precluding that possibility. It's making it impossible. And the structure of the Maimed is agricultural. In other words, the model, the metaphor is agriculture. Why do things grow? Not because we plant seeds, not because we plow, not because we irrigate, but because there's something called koyach atzmicha, ba'aras. It's the power of reproduction that God has planted in His earth that allows that when we do the things we do, the earth will give us its bounty. Similarly, we do many things in order to be aroused and inspired in a relationship with God, but in the end, the earth gives us the bounty, and the earth isn't us. The earth is the divine blessing that comes to us from on high. So we have an avoid maimer. In other words, everything about this maimer is about being a human being who is a servant of God on an altruistic level. And let's begin. There won't be any women who will lose their pregnancies or who will be barren, infertile in your land, which means in Eretz Yisrael. God will fill the number of our days. These are, of course, two of the three most basic blessings of a human being. Children, health, and sustenance. In this particular passage, you have uh, the first two of those three, bonnet, children, that women are not going to lose their pregnancies, nor will they be infertile, be'etecha means in the Holy Land, and we will live long life, which is the idea of chaya. But our Maimed interprets this Pasuk in completely a metaphysical way, based on the following premise. says it's known, just like down here there's an earth, and the earth is the seat of fertility, there's a reason they call it Mother Earth, because the, the earth nourishes and sustains by producing life as a mother produces life, as a female produces life, there is a metaphysical parallel to the physical earth, which is a spiritual earth, a, a land of life on high. From which flows, and life and sustenance, to the collective Jew, to all of us as a whole, as a unit, as a body, for the purpose of inspiring us to be spiritual people. The heavenly earth, the earth on high, uses its fertility to produce vitality, life, abundance, sustenance, that gives us love of God. To do all those commandments, which of course man must do, and as the Torah says, through Yiddishkeit we live. And he translates life, real life, meaningful life, permanent life, which means to say we're not concerned with things that are immediate and short-sighted, but things that are permanent and absolute, namely Torah and mitzvahs and the relationship with Hashem. Now this supernal, this heavenly, this metaphysical earth that nourishes us with a desire to have a relationship with God is dugmas ele tzalazu as is the case with the physical earth down here. It produces all kinds of pleasantries. To provide life through them for nefesh kolchoi, the life of all living things. But this is of course talking about chayim gashmim, physical life. And just as the physical earth produces agriculture, which ultimately sustains all living things, there is a spiritual parallel of that that produces 
spiritual fruit, which in effect means uh, inspiring within us passions and feelings for HaKadosh Baruch for God Almighty. Vizula sa, and if not for the earth, in Kim Vachayas, there can be no existence nor sustenance of life. To all those who live in the world, because you can't eat gold and silver. All the wealth of gold and silver are not going to sustain. If there won't be production from the earth. There's a famous story of one of the Rothschilds who got locked in his safe. And he died of starvation in a room full of gold. And he wrote in his own blood a note that said in effect you know this is what money can buy and this is the message of the Maimed that you can't eat gold you have to eat food similarly in spiritual terms Ebishta has sustained us with spiritual vitality and life and nourishment which is feelings for HaKadosh Baruch Vakach, just as it's true physically of agriculture whatever spiritual vitality comes to a person for studying Torah and serving God. Hakel, it's all It's flowing from the land of life on high. as the pasuk says, There's lands of life, which are the source of life for us down here. Line nine. It too is called the earth. As is the case with the physical earth. Though the truth of the matter is that production, reproduction, has to do with the earth, but it needs a stimulus. Element as you have to seed, you have to plant seeds. And when you plant the seeds, the earth uses the power of reproduction, of procreation, which it, God Almighty possessed it, within it. And that they should be through the earth. Growing and sprouting, all possibilities of reproductive life that comes from it. So there's a combination of the earth's possibility and a stimulation that comes from seeding and so forth. is true also of spiritual life. That come to us and that flow to us from the land of life, the spiritual land of life. They are drawn from the source, which is of course God Almighty, the source of all living things. He provides strength but Aretz and the earth, to make things grow. Similarly, the heavenly earth provides for us spiritual life. The thing that's so powerful about this and significant about this is, the Talmud says, which means in effect that we all believe that uh, free will is um, something which God has given man. We're now learning that the effectiveness of one's free will, in other words, the degree of success we will have in serving God has to do with God. Hashem decides, like it says in the Pasuk, Hashem decides how much ruchnis, how much godliness, how much alakus is going to come to Yankev Avinu. So the understanding is that our capacity to be spiritually sensitized, in tune, and successful is a blessing from HaKadosh Baruch. But it's not unilateral, it's not arbitrary, it's not singular. We have to do our work, which is Lachlish V'Rezreva, to plow and to seed. So the blessings, the power for Avoida comes, in fact, from Hashem, but it comes from Hashem in a context of our hard work. So both of these become requisites, necessary. We must know that Hashem provides us with the power for Avoida, and at the same time, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It has to do with our efforts, but we mustn't get too carried away with our own efforts. It says, and the Pasuk 8 is the a light which is planned for the righteous. Hashem plants a light in his earth for tzaddikim, and tzaddikim over here means tzaddikim, it doesn't mean exclusive, unique, distinctive personalities who are real tzaddikim, but all Jews are called tzaddikim. Because in this particular case, the word tzaddik, righteous person in this context does not mean the precise use of that word. The true concept of tzaddik, which is explained at length, especially in Tanya, what we mean when we say tzaddik, we mean every virtuous person, every person who cares. Let's say nilema, this means madregas adam kosher, the step and level of a righteous person, of an honorable man or woman. She'ein irasha chasasham was not a sinner. O kumesh kasev, as the Gemara says, tzaddik v'rasha leika amar, Hashem does not choose whether we be tzaddikim or not tzaddikim. This is up to our free will. And when one exercises his free will to be virtuous, do good things, they are called a tzaddik. 
And Oyer is a Ruah la Tadak. Hashem plants a light for a Tadak. And he interprets. Vaha'oyri, what is this light that Hashem plants in the supernal earth that we harvest through our efforts of planting and, and plowing? Avas Hashem. Hashem plants in His supernal earth the possibility to love God. And when we attempt to love God, we plow, we seed in order to access that love, that love reaches us and it flowers in the form of passions for Hashem. Uchukos, he loves Baruch and a thirst for God Almighty. Hanim shachla adam, which is drawn to a human being, he nehuza ruah benetzachayim. It's planted, in fact, in the heavens above, in the, in the world of life, which is metaphysical at tzadik, to the righteous person. Pirush, this means, leyeis tzadik, to be righteous. Umakushal bahavai, and attach to God Almighty, ledof kabei, to attach oneself to Him. So, the effort we have to make is to want and to invest in wanting to love Him. And of course, as is indicative from the continuation of this maimah, this is through what we call meditation, His bonanus. But the passions that we experience come from HaKadosh Baruch. V'zeit Yasem HaAdam Alivi, line 17, a person must remind himself. V'yei denemon, and he has to know thoroughly. V'yei mevim munish layman, really believe. Kikol ava v'yira, any kind of love and fear. Hanem shalchem, a love which come to the person is not his own success and efforts per se, but humat as a likim, it's a gift from God Almighty. Shenezen keich atzemech baratzal yen, he gives the power of creation, creativeness, to the heavenly uh, earth. Latzmiach to sprout avas avayevirase love of God and His fear al ponav on its countenance. In other words, there is a very delicate combination. We have to make an effort, but we must know that our success has to do with the Eretz Yen. Ve'einam nimshachim, and it's not brought mikeach adam eved atzmi from the efforts of the person doing the service by himself. So a person is walking a tightrope. They have to do everything they can to have a relationship with God and believe that the measure of their success is a gift from God Almighty. Volcano, therefore, line 20. Call liket ave dase, the essence of a person's service. Laiti aleavas Hashem meyatzma, it shouldn't be to love God as they want to love God in the subjective way. In other words, Yehu ha'evid, he should be considered the servants of God, the servant of God. Hu ha'ayev, he is the lover of a chulu and so forth. Another person is an ego, may say, just as one person wants to be loved by a uh, sports hero, or by an entertainer, or by a politician, he wants to be loved by God. So he loves God, so lo- God loves him, and there's egocentricity in this whole effort. Says the Alter Rebbe, that will fail. Kiyim, but rather, Kamesh Kosov, it says in the Pasuk, Vavadatem es havaya Service of God has to be to worship es Hashem Now this is a very weird Pasuk. Because means we have to serve God, which means to say help God. You serve a master who needs your help. And of course, the Alter Rebbe goes on to say, to interpret this literal is impossible. Because God needs our help. Is he deficient without us? And if we're righteous, are we actually giving him anything? So, which literally means we have to give something to God on a pshat level, it doesn't seem sufficient, doesn't seem reasonable. God doesn't need anything. And incidentally, before I even continue, there are many Maimari Hasidists that use this very Pasuk and Taka Maimarim of Lysiyah Meshachel Lepashas Mishpatim, that discuss the question of Avoidet Tzayra Gavaya, the idea how God benefits from our Taino Mitzvahs. Because if God does not benefit from our Taino Mitzvahs, how do you explain the Pasuk? But not in this Pasuk, in this Maimon. This Maimon says, doesn't mean that you're helping God, it means you're helping yourself through How do you explain it? You should serve so that as Hashem that God should become your personal God. The answer is not we're helping Alakus, but Kihavaya, the divine name of Pirusha, it means how God Almighty is beyond time. Vani a violation is the the world and the creation doesn't change him whatsoever. Vagul, the command, all of creation relative to God Almighty is cloth, shiv is of little and no value whatsoever. And therefore the Tater says, Vavalatem es havaya. Veti yave daschem kol kach. A Jew, a human being, should invest of himself so much. Achabachin is the level called Hashem, to which the world is totally inconsequential. Tiyat lechem. Should become your personal God. In other words, Elikim means godliness of concealment. Elikim means your personal godliness. As always, your own personal God. Al-Tarab discusses this at length in Tanya chapters 46 and 47. The in other words, she is Sheyre that godly's presence and awareness and potency 
should be manifest and fixed in the brain and the thought of the person. Impassionately felt and grasped in one's mind. I'm learning to turn to page 26, line 26. But MS in absolute truth. As though he's actually seeing God. So the way you would translate this pasuk is can't mean we're doing something for God. means instead I'm doing something so that the transcendent, infinite God becomes personal to me. So it's about me and my desire to have a connection to Him. My desire for the emes says the Alter Rebbe. The key to getting that is recognizing that we get it from God. Is a humility. And he continues on line 26, Val just as we interpret this one particular passage, that Yiddishkeit and Teiru Mitzvahs are ways of helping, uh, getting him to help us serve him through our efforts, as is indicated in the passage, and the same is true, who say, all the allusions to God, and the many, many times that we praise Him. For example, we call Malakei, Avram, the God of Avram. It doesn't mean the God of Avram, it means the personal God of Avram. Hagadol means the God of kindness, which is unique to me, Vachulu, and so forth. In other words, means the idea that the transcendent God should be invested in my personal, my individual, my specific um, identity. And this is what the Gemara says, line 28, wherever you can identify the greatness of God. In other words, if you are able to see that God is great, you're seeing His humility. Why? The true greatness of God is beyond comprehension. And if you're able to look at what God has done and say He's great, that means He's sufficiently reduced His presence so that it should appear to you to be great. Because the truth of the matter is, cool, everything compared to the absolute truth of God, this clock shift has no value. And Hashem's efforts in manifesting in the various different attributes is a is a humility. He's descending from his absolutely infinite place to have a relationship with us. That's what really lies at the core of Avoida. The core of Avoida means I am trying. Hashem is helping me succeed. I'm a- I want. The truth. I want to feel God. I want a relationship with Hashem. I want to have intellectual and emotional, spiritual stimulation. It's a gift from Hashem, which I make myself a vessel for. And I have to remember both of those things. Which is the basis of how Hashem, so to speak, rewards us for efforts with a spiritual attachedness. This is a great service. That a physical brain of a human being should be able to be to grab and to um, grasp Gili al is Barach divine revelation. So the Alter Rebbe says that our duty and our job is to open ourselves up to experience the passions of God and not to forget that those passions come from Him. When a person uses his mind to have it, an intellectual attachedness to Hashem, they'll develop their passions and their emotions because they will give birth to Midas Ava Vayira, the attributes of love and fear. Vinikraim b'shem elada, they're going to be called birth. So the analogy continues, right? The, the person is an earth in which avas Hashem and yiras Hashem, passions for God, sprout forward and grow. The source of that sprouting forth and growing is the sprouting forth and the growing of the heavenly audits. And in both cases, we have to prepare ourselves to receive these passions through our own efforts at. Um, his bondanus and internalizing God and so forth and so on. But we must remember that it's all about God's help. And he says, why do we call the passions in the heart children? A son is love and a daughter is fear. It doesn't mean that it's psychologically this way. It means they mystically represent. The son represents a desire to be close to Hashem and um, the daughter represents the fear of being separated from Hashem. Love is like a son, which means the male has to do with chesed. And Yira fears to do with the daughter. Which is why the Gemara says, when a person has a daughter first, it's a good sign for children. So in conventions it's interpreted to mean if you have a daughter first, they will help you raise your sons and so forth and so on. But here it's interpreted very simple. That if you want to serve Hashem with the proper framework of emotions, first you have to have Yira and then you have to have Ahava. First you have to have awe and fear of him. 
Ki zeh ha'ashar la'ashem, this is the gateway to God. K'me shekosa b'mokam achad, that's going in other places. And of course, other places means Tanya chapter 41. Reish yasa avoy dev ikir v'shosh, the beginning of being a Jew, is Kabbalah se'el and bitl. The Gemara tells a story in Gitin, Gitin, which is an uncomfortable story. It really is an uncomfortable story. In that Gemara, there's a personality by the name of Bardar Reim, which means the man of the south. There's many opinions as to who this was, but he was an unbelievable warrior. So great a warrior that he wasn't afraid to engage the Romans. The Gemara describes his personal prowess. He could leap incredible distances and with one swipe of his sword kill innumerable Romans. So the Gemara says that he told God, you don't have to help me, just don't help my enemies. Which is, of course, the epitome of arrogance. So the Gemara tells us that he went to the bathroom and he was bitten by a scorpion and he died. And that was the end of him and unfortunately the end of the Jews. The single number one enemy against any kind of success in any area, and certainly in avoid us Hashem, is arrogance. And the greatest tool for having success in Avedis Hashem is humility. And of course, the point of this Maimit is that even when it comes to religious matters, where we say, it's about us and not about God, there it's also true that we have to allow God to help us, and that is the basis for our entire success. The Pinchas Karatzeh had a Talmud who was very frum, who uh, Pesach went to such lengths to make sure that his house was kosher, that he wouldn't even eat in the table of his own Rebbe, the Pinchas of Karetz. So one year Pesach, the Pinchas Karetz called him to the Seder, and he refused. He says, I am eating myself. And he called him religiously for every meal, twice every day of Yom Tif, by night and by day, three times on Shabbos. And each meal, this Talmud of the Pinchas Karetz said, Pesach, I'm by myself. You know, I'm so religious, I can't even trust my Rebbe. On the last day of Pesach, he was invited to the last meal of Pesach. And of course, we know that in Achran Shal Pesach, we have a third meal, even if it's in Ch- not Shabbos, called the Mesi- Mashiach Suda or the Baal Shem Tev Suda. And he invited this disciple of his to join him for the last meal of Pesach. And again, he turned him down. So the Pinchas Karz told him to take a look at his water barrel. He had a barrel which he had personally selected and collected water from a well. And he had sieved it, I don't know how many times, to make sure the water would be pure and kosher of Pesach. He looks into the barrel of water, and at the bottom of the barrel there's an actual wheat, a kernel of wheat, which could have cracked open and become chometz and made his water chometz, which meant that his whole Pesach was in great jeopardy of uh, being a, a total failure. He was so devastated. He came running to his Rebbe, he says, Rebbe, God knows how particular I am about Pesach. How could God have done this to me? How could God allow me to fail at a basic level? So the Pinchas Karetz had told him, we all need God's help. And we all have God's help. This is especially true Pesach when the issue is mashu, a, a microcosm, microscopic, or microscopic is inappropriate, but a, a small measure of chametz is an issue. So we can only do it with God's help. Unless we say to God, I'll manage, I'll do it myself. When a person says to God, I'll manage, I'll do it myself, God says, by all means, show me that you can do it. And then you can end up with a vetzel, with a wheat, in your uh, water. And that's the message of this moment. And I continue reading on line 35. As opposed to when one doesn't serve God in this way, in this style. In other words, he also wants the truth. But he wants the truth to be his own invention. He also wishes to love God and be passionate with love and fear of God Almighty. But to love God and be in awe of God, but at his own achievement, rather than humble himself and recognize that God is helping him. It says, The person will fail. That never, His passions of fear and love will never be true. The kinds of passionate feelings will have to God will be considered fantasies that are futile. In other words, the emotions will be so peripheral, so skin deep, so superficial, it's not going to translate as practical life at all. Shudavash in Lekiyam has no survival. El it's very momentary. And therefore, v'nikra b'chinezu meshakela. This is called meshakela. Meshakela means a woman who loses her pregnancies. She eladiz v'kevera. She buries, she gives birth to, and she buries. And of course, the nimshal is. We're talking about a person 
who's meditating on the greatness of God because he wants the truth. He's developing passions for God because he wants to feel the truth. But he wants that truth to come from himself. Those emotions die like, God forbid, those children who die in, in birth. And that's the pshat. Leitia mishakelo. Your avoid as Hashem shouldn't be such that all of your passions should die. Vakara. And then, of course, there's the infertile woman, the barren woman. The person has no passions whatsoever. So Meshakela means you have feelings for God that pass. Akana means you can't develop any feelings for God, and the root of it is your arrogance and self-centeredness. And this is the meaning of the apostle. In your lands, there shouldn't be people who lose, who have stillborn children who don't get pregnant. What is the reason that this person's spiritual passions for God are either going to die or never be born in the first place? They're in your own land. In other words, it's supposed to come from the higher land. It's supposed to be that our passions come from Hashem. When you say, I can love God on my own. I can develop passions and feelings for God Almighty without, so to speak, the help of God, then, quote, He doesn't help. And then either we get emotions that are short and, short-lived and peripheral, or we don't get the emotions at all. And then there's a third madriga, line 40. There's even a more severe case of infertility in spiritual terms, which is a person who not only can't feel God, can't emotionally feel connected to God consistently, but they can't even intellectually relate to God. Which is the Gemara calls it apostolic ain't love lot. And she has no children, I feel base for the English. She doesn't even have a uterus. In other words, sometimes a woman is infertile. God forbid that it should never happen because there's a problem with, with fertility, with the production of eggs, with the way the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the aspects of the biology are designed and constructed to affect the maximum likelihood of, of fertilization and so forth. There's all kinds of explanations why women don't get pregnant. But then there's a woman who simply doesn't have the plumbing. She doesn't have the necessary uh, organs that allow for pregnancy. This is a much more severe case of infertility. What does this mean spiritually? Which means, they were completely closed off. There's no pathways, there's no channels internally that allow for the possibility of, inf- of fertilization. Peter, the person is so closed up, it doesn't have a space where the pregnancy can actually manifest altogether. Well, that also the same is true in spiritual terms. What does it mean spiritual to be infertile to the degree that you can't even have the possibility of fertility? There is the parallel of this in our spiritual service of God, which is not only can't they feel the truth in their heart, and not only the truth that they feel in the heart, deficient, short-lived, and fleeting, but they can't even have God in their mind, in their intellect. Kasher, who as it is, mach mashen l'kliya, mach doesn't have a vessel to hold it. So mishakele means someone who has passions for God that pass. Akara either means someone who has an intellectual sense of God that no passions, or a worse kind of an akara where they can't even have intellectual knowledge of God, which Al-Tareba discusses at the beginning of chapter 18. We call the cup of salvation. In other words, we are spiritually tuned in because we make ourselves a vessel to receive that spiritual intuness. A vessel to receive supernal kindness. A vessel which is meant to hold blessing. Which could, in theory, receive the one that gives joy. Which begins with the meditation into the greatness of Hashem. And ends in the feelings and passions for Hashem. V'hainu, this is only possible because Shu Klirekin if it's an empty vessel. And the Rebbe has a beautiful sikh we observe that it's very different between empty and broken. Broken vessels leak, they hemorrhage. It's not good. Shattering itself is not good. But an empty vessel means humility, you allow God in. If a person considers the center of his universe, his spiritual universe himself. He considers himself an entity unto his own. And what does he want as a selfish, egocentric being? A relationship with God Almighty would sound quite altruistic and ideal, but because you need this to further enhance your ego, you're pushing away that possibility. 
Therefore, he really is not serving God, but his own interests. He's saying, this is what I desire. This is good for me. This I cannot do, and so forth. And of course, there's an inevitable number of details about this whole issue. In general, we can all relate to this. We can all relate to the idea that we can find ourselves in situations where not only are we dispassionate about God, in other words, we can't feel the truth, we're intellectually stuffed, we can't even understand it. Um, whether we're dealing with lay people, or we're dealing with the clergy, any time a person's Yiddishkeit centers around themselves, the result of this is, the mind is closed. Not only they can't feel, they can't even understand. The Kotzke Rebbe said, Who is God? Where is God? And he answered that, Who is God? Wherever you allow him in. A Chsidah Shayyid by the name of Rabbi Saul Nevler was visited by two young men who entered into his home, which was in Tashkent in Asia, where the home was very low and the, the lintel was quite low and when they're walking through the front door they smashed their heads against the top of the door and uh, Rabbi Shalom Nevler said to them the vase for us to song club the cup you know why you smashed your head well the vilsich nish begin you don't want to bend this maimer describes mishakela v'akona b'atzech a person wants God but wanting God can be uh, an alternative form of narcissism. I want spirituality, just like another person wants pizza. In which case, the Maimah says, what you'll produce in your relationship with God will be mishakela, short-lived passions. Akara, no passions at all. And what's worse, akara, an inability to even intellectually tune in. And the answer, of course, is to remember kihu hanes and the chokeh, las is true spiritually, also not just materially. And that's what he fin- follows up and he says, How do we qualify ourselves? That in fact, we should be inspired Jews, we should be inspired by the truth, because we create space within ourselves for God to empower us to love Him. He mentions two ideas. Number one, That God rests in a place of brokenness. The greatest vessel for godliness is humility. And I repeat again, there's a difference between brokenness and humility. A shattered person isn't a vessel for anything. A humble person is a vessel for everything. Empty and not shattered. Like a person who wishes to design a, a vessel that can hold things out of a raw piece of metal or wood or stone. You beat it around and around with a hammer. Until you create an empty space. A person must also be beaten. And he should lower himself to be humbled. In other words, he shouldn't define his own relationship with God based on his own ego. In other words, that he should make himself into an empty space. He weren't there. And that invites God's blessings. And in this case, the blessings that God Amaimon is addressing is the blessing of Ruchni, the blessing of Avas Hashem and Yiras Hashem. So the first answer to the spiritual dilemma of I want God and I want to feel God is that it shouldn't be about my ego, it should be about God Himself, it should be about humility. And then there's a second one. Yahweh Hayoim Yoim, which says, I think Yem Shmuel Munka says, that when I visited the Alter Rebbe the first time, I decided, quote, Vosas Vilzer Zom Menisht Hobbit, whatever I desire I shouldn't have, which is called the bending oneself. Alter Rebbe's Hasidim took this very, very plain and very basic. If I desired something material, I should not have it. This was not the Musa model of sigufim, infliction and suffrage and punishing yourself. But this was, as it says in the Yom Yom Bishvil, Bittl Shvira Satayve. You want to break lust. In other words, we all have weaknesses. Our weaknesses are not just individual weaknesses, but they make us weak human beings. If we want to become strong people, we have to overcome all our weaknesses.
The Alter Rebbe's Hasidim's philosophy was that in order to overcome all weakness, said in other words, in order to be fully empowered, to be in control of their own lives, anything that makes them weak isn't good for them. So if they desired it, they shouldn't have it. And that becomes the second point. How do we open ourselves up for passions for God, which God empowers us with, uh, by not being weak? And we're not weak by not giving in to our temptations. Achoid achasi ma'ashomer razal. There's another idea of how we make ourselves vessels to receive the blessings of God for feelings for Him, which is Masha'om Razal, where the Gemara says, The vessel that holds blessing needs to be rinsed. And what does it mean to be rinsed? To be in control of our vessel. The Ha'in Yinhu, and this means, Let's say a person is naturally humble. To gain you only a person is poor, vainly metzach doesn't have any arrogance and conceit to say, I am going to serve God as I. Oit tzarechu, there's a second requirement that qualifies and allows for a human being to open themselves up to the blessing of God, of loving Him, which is, shalayat alibe, he shouldn't permit himself, even things that are materially permitted. Lies mekusher bohem b'chalei v'nefesh, nothing in the material world is a lot of S- s- distract him to the degree that he's obsessed with it or preoccupied with it. You can do all of those material things without any passions, line 56. Because when one indulges in material things and becomes engaged and preoccupied with them, you can't be a vessel for godliness until one purifies himself. It says in the Archei Sadiqim, which is one of the oldest Muslims, for him, fire and water can't cohabit. A love for God and love of materialism can't cohabit either. And therefore, in order to love God and to have intellectual sensitivity to godliness, we need divine help. And what we need to do, in addition to the meditations themselves, is humble ourselves and discipline ourselves. A dirty vessel. You wouldn't want to put water into a dirty glass till you rinsed it. And a woman can't conceive and get pregnant. Even if she has a uterus and all the rest of the necessities. To be purified from her earlier cycle of Tuma. And only then is there a possibility to conceive and have a baby. And of course this represents that we can experience passions for God through our humility and through our discipline. This is the basic Maimer. The basic Maimer says, That in your passions for God, beware of the passions being uh, short-lived or not manifest or we don't even have the capacity to be intellectual about God. And the, the ways to prevent those things are is by remembering that God provides us with those possibilities. There's one more point that this Maimer brings, basically. There's an interesting story that I heard from my Mashpia, an opinion in Yeshiva, where the previous Rebbe once walked outside in a frigid afternoon in the middle of a winter in Lubavitch in his shirt sleeves. And he sees a boy of the Yeshiva walking around in his shirt sleeves. And he calls the boy by name and he says, Shmedel. Let's just say for the sake of argument, Pavos room on a mantle. Ken Why are you walking around without a coat? You can get sick. And of course, it seemed incredulous. Here, the Rebbe, incredible. The Rebbe himself is without a coat. And the Rebbe adds, Mir Hitman, I'm being guarded. The end of the story was that this boy never left Yiddishkeit. And it turned out that the Rebbe didn't mean you're going to get physically sick. He meant you're going to get spiritually sick. And he said, I'm being guarded. There's another idea, and that is Shmira. Shmira means guarding or preserving. Once we establish priority one, which is I want a relationship with God. And priority two, I want a relationship with God because it's the truth. And priority three, that this is only possible with the help of God. And therefore priority four is I have to humble myself. I have to preserve that I shouldn't become arrogant later. I have to protect myself again getting into trouble once a person is engaged and involved with God. And if you think about these issues, and certainly if you've attempted these issues, if you're serious about these things, this is totally realistic. The Kuntus Omayan has two Maimorim, Tezvav and Tezayin, that talk to the Ben Teira, to the scholar, to the rabbi, to the pious one, to the chassid, 
And he says the beginning of the collapse of the Chassid Zavod Hashem is Machazik Toivala Atme. He notices that he's arrived, that he's achieved, that he's great, that he's a champion. You know, the famous Hasidic quote, Yechenikein Godl Shimish Enim Shone Venasat Stuki. Yechen of the high priest served God for 80 years and he became a Tzaduki, a heretic, a Sadducee. How can one serve God for 80 years in the Holy of Holies and you keep it and fall? And the answer is, she mishmeinim mishani served God for 80 years, Venas he became self-righteous. He became a tzaddik in his own mind. And that was the beginning of his spiritual collapse. And once a person has achieved a plateau of avoida, where they study God and meditate and experience passions for Hashem, they still need a shmita. They need to be protected against getting caught up with themselves and being a graduate chassid, which is the beginning of the end of the chassid. And that's what the Maimon now continues and he says, After you've cleaned the vessels, umudachas, and you've rinsed it, and as a result there is space in you for God to give you the gift of passion, to be in love with Him and seriously impassioned with His truth. There's one more thing that must be added. Which is represented by the idea, line 60, what does in the post like, Chana prayed for a son in the beginning of Samuel, as we all know. But listen to the words precisely. Chana prayed on God. And she cried. It should say El Hashem, which means to God. It doesn't say that. Al Hashem, above Hashem. So although this is a figure of speech, you know, this is not such a great question on a pshat level, but Hasidus observes and accentuates this nuance. Why does it say she's davening on Hashem? And of course the answer is, she's trying to reach beyond the divine name Hashem. Al means higher than Hashem. Kihine. Knesset Yisrael yesh lakama bechines v'shemes. The collective Jew, the spiritual collective Jew has many names. Each name represents a different notion. Ukishihi bebechines heilada when it's in a state of procreation, which means to produce passions for God, which are called children. She's called Leah, who's the mother of the children. However, when she's barren and infertile, and we're talking not about the physical condition of a woman, but the metaphysical condition of the collective Jew who's barren. In other words, she's incapable of bringing forward love and fear of God Almighty. She carries in him Chana. As it's described in the Tanakh, Chana has no sons, no children. And of course, there was actually a physical Chana who physically didn't have children, who physically prayed and was physically blessed. But the issue of the Maimed is that we're explaining this metaphysically, that there is a Jew who has no children, which means to say he wants the truth. And he's dispassionate, he can't have that truth. And then of course, he may acquire it and get the passion as our Maimed described. But now he has to preserve it. V'ha'etzehi, and the solution is, but the spalal chana alavaya, chana davens alavaya, higher than havaya. Not just that she should have children there, but once she has children, in other words, once she develops passions and feelings for Hashem, she should preserve them and maintain them. V'ha'inyan, line 64, the idea is, ki nishem havaya, the divine name Hashem, yutke vavke, which we know as the supreme or primary name of God, is still a name of God that denotes his relationship with creation. Because Moira indicates al shame the idea, line 65 now, Shemahaves Akil Miyayon Yesh. The divine name Yud Kevavke has many interpretations. One of them is Yud Kevavke means the divine name of God that creates. As I told you in previous classes, the three letters Hoive, which means to create, and the Yud with the Shavah indicates present tense, constantly created. Vishemze, and the divine name Havaya, which is the divine power invested in creation, is Bechal Elamus. Exists in each world that's a creation of the divine name of Avaya. Atzilos, Bia, Yetzir, Asiya. Sheikhilag Bineya, the distinction between one world and the next is only Elah, Shezeh Bada, Vezeh Yetzer, Vecholu. Each one is a different type of a creation. Avaldeh Rechlau, the rule is, Hinehu Mechayes Kulam. All of them are creations, and all of them need to be sustained. Umahava Aisam, it creates them in Ayin Liyesh from non existential existence into actual existence. And that's what Havaya Yud Kevavke means, the divine investment in creation. Ach To be sure, this name of God Almighty in truth does not apply to God as He is by Himself alone. But Elah Lagabiya Elam is only His relationship with worlds. When God is creating worlds, you can call Him Havaya. 
Hanetzolim, which means Atzilus, Vanemroim, which means Bria, Vanetzim, which means Yetzira, Vanas, which means Asiya. Avalagabi, Akadish Baruch Hu Vechei Deviatim, we talk about God is alone, which we frequently call Atzimus Amhus, he in relationship with himself, Leshayach Klal Leim Hashem Zeh, you cannot call him Yudke Vavke. Because Avaya means creator, and in as much as he's concerned, not only is he above the being invested in creation, the creation itself is not a world, it's him. The Kula Kamei, all next to him, Klach Shiv has no worth. Ve'einam nitfasim etzlei, in relationship to the private truth of God, they have no value, beget the Metzies Klal, as self-contained entities whatsoever. Kamei Shekosav, as the Apostlech says, first of all, Ani Avaya Leishanisi, I Havaya haven't changed, in other words, I made a world, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm still as one as I was before creation. Just as God was alone prior to creation, He's alone subsequent to the creation. In other words, creation is a perspective. To us, the world is real. To God, the world continues to be God. The divine name of Havaya is godliness only in as much as there is a world, and that is God is alone. Now, I want to confuse you just for a moment. Okay, So if, if the following confuses you, the confusion will end. Soon, so don't worry about it too much. The Rebbe has a letter written to Rabbi Zevin, who was writing the encyclopedia on Shemes. And uh, the Rebbe wrote him this letter, and Zevin told the Rebbe that if he would send him the idea and some sources, he would include it in the Encyclopedia Talmud. It's one of the few cases where Encyclopedia Talmud brings from Hasidus Chabad. In that particular letter, the Rebbe brings three translations of Havaya. The lowest translation is Havaya Loshan Mahava, the creator. The second translation of Havaya is Havaya Loshan Hoya Hoya Vavya, higher than time, which goes on in Sof. And the third is Avayah Shem Ha'etzam, the name of God Himself. And there's actually a Maimir, Shvuas Reish Nun Vov, Pesach Reish Nun Zayin. And I think it's also mentioned in a little bit in Samach Tes that explains why you can call Atzmas Avayah. Clearly, this Maimir doesn't agree with that. And it's not a Kash. This Maimir is going with the presumption that Avayah only means Havaya Lashem have a creator. And therefore, you cannot use the illusion Yud Kevavki except in relationship with the world. So be aware that in other Maimodim there are different versions of this. Of course, it's based on the Kabbalah Svarim, the Sefer called Ginas Egez, that talks about Shema Vaya, which is what Hasidus quotes when it wants to talk about Shema Etzem, Shema Yucha, Shema Mfurish. This is not relevant to us. What is relevant to us, in other words, the version of Havaya, this Maim it is, that Havaya only means, you can only call God Havaya as much as he's a creator. Line 71. And according to our Maimeh, that you can only call Hashem Havayin as much as he's a creator, we can explain what it says in Medish. Before creation, he and his name were alone. It doesn't say HaKadosh Baruch Hu Vahashem alone. HaKadosh Baruch Hu Shmoy. Because this Maimeh wants to separate. When you say Shmoy, you don't mean the name Havayin, you mean something much higher than that. Peter Shmei Levad. You mean the idea of God's name as God's name is by himself. Sheshmoi, that the divine name, we don't even know what it is, has no criteria of being a creator and a sustainer of life, klal whatsoever, Elohu Levadi is alone. In other words, God has a name, and we don't know what that name is, because it's not reflected in the creation. The highest name we know is Havaya, but you can only apply that name to God in as much as He is a creator. What about Him alone? He has a name, we don't know what it is, because it's beyond Havaya. Al Havaya, as Chana says. The divine name is alone, and only Havaya is invested. This is a Pasuk in Tilim, right? You praise God, the name is alone. His ray, his glow, his shine comes down into the earth, and in this context, what is invested in the world would be called Havaya, and what is not invested in the world would be called Shmai, which is higher than Havaya. V'niskav who made Ahla Flaga Yisrael. The word niskav, which is translated in English uselessly as exalted. Don't feel bad if you don't know what exalted means. Nobody else knows. But it means being higher than. And it's higher, but that's a flog in an, in, 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 in an extreme way, in an awesome way. Shumuflog harba mi'elamis. He's totally separate from the world. Even hanet sol v'chul, even atzilus. Rak, the only investment of Hashem in His creation is not Himself, not even His so-called name, but only the name Havaya, a certain ray of His possibility, which is called Havaya, Loshan Mahava, that creates, is invested in the creation. But He alone, and even Shmai alone, are removed from the creation altogether. Peter just means, that it brought forward, a shine, a ray, a glow of His name. Lachayes, 
Eretz V'shamayim, to give life to heaven and earth. Now, that ray and shine which comes forth to give life to heaven and earth would be called in this Maimet Havaye. And the truth of God Almighty's name is unidentified. Shmoy. He has a name, we don't know what it is, because it's not at all represented in this world. So Havaye, which is the favorite, the highest name of God as we know in the Siddur and the Nacht and so forth and so on, is in this particular Maimet limited to God's relationship with the creation. Now the next couple of lines have to be seen as an aside, as a tangent. Achvayorim ken liyam. Hashem separates a horn, a beam for His people. Ksiv, the Tater says. This means, in other words, that even though the entire investment of God in creation is Havaye, not Shmoy, not the divine name, which is Shmoy Levade, God's name alone, the Jewish nation, through Tater Mitzvahs, access, not just the creative power of the Creator, but the name of God as He is alone, the truth of God Almighty. Liyes lei, liyam kerevi, that his nation that's close to him, liyes kerevi melov, should be close to him, ba'atzmi as he is by himself, k'de lakarva melov, to bring them close to him, liyes likolol b'yechudei yisbarach, to be included in his oneness. K'mesh Yekosov, it says in Siddur, and it's explained at length in Tanya chapter 49, and before that chapters 46 and 47, chem lo g'de lo v'yeseid of achuli, a great and abundant compassion, k'mesh Yekosov b'mokamacha, as discussed at length, at length means Tanya perik memtesa and before. The point is that all of the investment of Hashem in creation is only Avaya. And when it comes to Yidin, there's something much deeper. Shmoy Levade, the notion of God's name as it exists, removed from the world, is made available to the Jewish nation. The result of this is as follows. Umizet is light A person recognizes this and says, I'm not interested in the world. And therefore, I'm not going to be satisfied by the godliness which sustains the world, which in this context is Havaya. And therefore, lahash lich nafshem ineged, one wants to is prepared to throw away his life inasmuch as he's a physical being. Lim say nafshem to sacrifice one soul. Al kid is Hashem bepel mamish to sanctify the name of God bepel mamish. In actual fact, in other words, it doesn't mean chas v'sholem hey pchachai, but rather li is nefesh tsmeya a thirsty soul vekolsa and longing and expiring la Hashem to God. But over here, la Hashem can't mean havaya has to be. Higher than Avaya. That my spirit should join with the spirit of God, which is discussed in Tanya Perik Mavav, and I don't want to get into it. The Hainu, in other words, that the person says to himself, I want the truth. The truth is not what I see in the world. The truth is not material reward or spiritual reward. The truth is God. And the truth is not even godliness in as much as he's Mahava, Shem Avaya. The truth is Shmoy, which is even higher than that. The Hainu, in other words, all of a person's thought, speech, and deed should be singularly connected to the thought, speech, and deed that God wants us to be involved with, which is umitzvis, His commandments, from the depths of our soul, with a cleaving and a longing and so forth. describes it, Forty-four. And what it speaks about is that when a person doesn't have something, they want it even more. In the darkness of the night, the desire for God becomes increased because of the distance. And when we recognize that all of the divine investment in creation is, quote, only Havaya, Lush, and Mahave, you want to get past that. You want the truth. Vazehu, which is the meaning of this pasuk, but this Pavel Chana al Havaya. That Chana's prayer is not simply to have the truth of God who is the creator, but the truth of God as he is alone, higher than Havaya. The word tefillah to pray means to be attached. She wished to become attached to the truth of God. In other words, That means to create and to give life to the world. But rather, To want the truth of God. To give away everything we have. To have Him as He is alone. So there is the pursuit of God. And what we want is to intellectually fill our minds with God and to spiritually, emotionally fill our hearts with God, which is called in the Tanya and the the mystery of being a Jew. Or if you will, the personal dimension of being a Jew. Everyone is different. The mind and the heart, as it says in fact in the beginning of Tanya chapter 44 that I mentioned a moment ago. And then beyond that, there's the recognition of I want the truth of God that's even beyond what the world provides. And this is going to provide a shmira. Here's how. 
Misham Nimshach, from the truth of God that's higher than God available through creation, you bring forward Bechinus Rachem and Rabim, great compassions, on Litus Alakus Rebbe in one's soul. What's the, what's the compassion for the soul? What's my soul doing in this world? You know, the Mitla Rebbe said the famous quote shortly before he passed away. Um, he, he, became, he went into a dveikos and the Hasidim were worried about him and they asked him if he heard what he said and he said, quote, I'm th- I heard, Vos tut aza aza What is such a lofty soul living in such a uh, lowly world? And every one of us is to some degree in that space. And when one reaches Al Hashem, in other words, the recognition that there's truth to God beyond the world, you say, it's a Rachmanis, my soul is trapped in the world. Which is why Hannah cries to arouse these incredible mercies, to access uh, uh, something which is beyond the limitations of the world. Line 84. Which is the meaning of that the God Almighty is the king who is removed and alone. He's beyond the very notion of time and the worlds that are time based and framed. Shahu, in other words, Piddish, this means. Shahu, in other words, is Ram, Venisa, Megadra, Bechina, Salem. He's exalted and above the criteria of worldliness, which means time and space and limitation. Therefore, we say to God Almighty, You have mercy on us. In your great mercies. As you are capable of mercy beyond the limitations of the world. In other words, you see the divine soul, which is trapped in the framework of the world you know better than us. What kind of rachmanis, what kind of compassion should be disposed towards a soul that comes from God, that's stuck in a framework of a world? That you are above, because you're above the limitations of time. Uh, beyond being understood. So, God, the truth of God, has a much more profound sense of rachmanis al kalayla, the compassion of all of the worlds. Even the highest worlds, even the highest Ganadin, will the higher and higher. You know, the, the, the mental foot of us used to say, What's meant? Steam with the whole steam in, right? Things that are secret from those who, who are secret. He says, Of steam in is a rachmonis. While their vase, as Chacha Philo, where the steam in, the emiss from the baby, is steam with the whole steam in, from them, Echet Bahal. This is the truth. All of the worlds relative to the truth are insignificant. It's a Rachmanas in all of them. And therefore, Shaykh Hatzlai, only God, has the full sense of Rachmanas, of compassion in all of the worlds. Kikulam, Shvelam, Etz, they're all insignificant to him. There's a Sugi Yechzid, it's called Rachmim. There's in Samach Hei. The Rachmim is a Murgish, and Rachmim is a Reimus, and Rachmim is a which I'm not going to get into. But the one that's relevant to us is that there's a Klau that says, Teva HaMereimim Liyesnem Shechal HaShafu. A great person has greater capacity for compassion because compassion has to do with seeing a person from a distance. When you're far away and you see the, the pitiful existence of the person, it arouses a different kind of compassion. So the Maimon is saying, only God knows what kind of Rachmanas it's on us. So the crying that Chana is doing is to arouse Rachmin from Hashem on her and her offspring, which is the Ava Vayida, which she arouses. And of course the point is, as a Shemitah, like I told you before, the worlds themselves cannot pity themselves in the way God can see our insignificance and pity us. The lower in the chain of worlds one descends, one's perception of what is real, and therefore the degree of compassion one can feel for one's lowliness is diminished. Add to the degree in our physical world, we have no sense of, none of us feel bad about being physical beings in context of God because we don't know Him. Even on the physical world. As we are part of the world, we cannot feel that compassion. Line 90. The argument is compassion comes from one who is greater to someone who is lower. And because he's above, he has a fire, far better perspective on Rachman. He is exalted beyond search. His compassion for us are abundant. That Though he is removed from the world altogether, at the same time, what is the v'cholu? Though he's completely removed from the creation, he can invoke mercies on the creation if we arouse them. 
And but the spal el Chana al Havaya. Chana cries out for the truth of God, which is beyond the God of the creation, that God should have Rachmanis on the creation. That's why she cries. That Hashem, the God of the world, should have compassion on us. And here's the point. The reason we're asking Hashem to have mercy upon us. And by the way, in the Maimonim of Anila Daidi, you have a similar idea. Since we don't have a perception or a possibility of perception, what kind of Rachmanis it is upon us? You should arouse those mercies upon us. For what purpose? We shouldn't drown and become immersed in this world. He should protect us. This is a Shemitah. A Shemitah means we should remain spiritual beings whose interest is spirituality. And we shouldn't become caught up in materialism. And the context is, even once a person has achieved an understanding of God and feelings for God, which are a gift from God, we say, protect me from becoming satisfied with my spiritual achievement and becoming materially distracted. A shield. And miska he hovers above us. Pirish miska vetkemechaymin he hovers above us like a wall that protects. Vechein magen who machsel lahasnef the eved the word magen means a shield to protect us from all kinds of objections, uh, uh, objectionable things. So the point is, there is avodas Hashem that's rooted in the recognition that everything we have God gives us, and above that, above the avodas Hashem is the preservation of that avoda which we access by asking Hashem to show us infinite mercies from His truth which is higher than our reality, to protect us and keep us spiritually in tune. And everybody knows how real this is. You know, Reb Nissen, Nemenov, who lived well into his 80s, uh, I read in his biography that his greatest fear was to become what he used to call in the olden days a fartike, to feel like I have a spiritual, a Hasidic graduate. Hasidus ends when you're a graduate. And that would be cat- catastrophic, terrible, because... Chetiris never ends. Avoida never ends. Relationship with God never ends. And the Shemitah that this Maimon is describing is a very important part of that. The Altarebbe finishes with a couple of final thoughts and all woven into the fabric of the Pusik. But let's preface. The language of the Stark, Reb Tuvia Blau, was here in Tavshin Chafalaf. Tishrei Tavshin 1960. Came to the Rebbe. That was the first time they had a chartered plane come into the Rebbe. It was a big deal. And he wrote a diary of that visit. And in his diary, he wrote that the Rebbe is a person who watches every second of his time. Cholerega. He sent a copy of his diary into the Rebbe, and the Rebbe actually made some corrections. And one of the corrections the Rebbe made was that he crossed out the word Rega and wrote the word Daka. He had written the Rebbe guards every second, and the Rebbe wrote that he guards every minute. It's an incredible story, because it brings out how serious the Rebbe is. In other words, there's nothing to be exaggerated about. The Rebbe says, I don't preserve every second, but I do guard every minute. And by taking away from his description of the Rebbe's precise measure of time, he's indicating that in fact, this is the degree to which the Rebbe watches his time. A minute. The story goes, the Rebbe was once standing outside the Fri, the Rebbe's room in New York, waiting to go into Yechidis, and a fellow was in front of him, and the Rebbe said, uh, he, he said to the Rebbe, you're after me. How much time do you need with the Rebbe? He says to our Rebbe. And the Rebbe says, 10 minutes. He says, oh, because go ahead of me. I can spare 10 minutes. So our Rebbe said, 10 minutes? 10 minutes is a lifetime. The Rebbe was shocked by a person being prepared to just sacrifice 10 minutes. The, one of the last points in the Maimir is, as mispa yamecha male, right? Like, Don't allow your desire for God to become self-centered, in which case you're... Avas Hashem will be short-lived, or you won't have it at all, or you won't even have a capacity to have Yediyas Hashem. As misparamecha yamale, you have to use every minute, fill every moment with goodness. V'hin eksiv the Teda says, V'avram, Zakin Baba Yamim, Avram was old, and he came along with his days. Peter, Zakin, is Eshek HaNachach. The meaning of Avram being old is that he had wisdom. V'am, Ra'al Pasek B'yashishim Chachma, the Pasek says, aged people, sages have wisdom. And the Chazal interpret that as one ages, as we age, we become more settled. That's a fact of life. I mean, empty people become more crazy as they age. Sophisticated, deeper people become more settled as they age. The Hainu, this means, that when one service of God should be, constant, and collected. As opposed to being uh, flip-flop all over the place. 
All of one's days must be whole, and for one's days to be whole, they must be consistent and settled. So the Zayad interprets on the passing of Avraham Zakan Baba Yomim that every single day of Avraham's life was accounted for. Imagine a person living 175 years and saying, I know where every hour went. Because the days that God Almighty gives us are according to the years that's been pre this determined for us to live we were not given in vain even one extra hour al over the measure shashir which was measured upon high kama one needs to make himself whole and one of the keys or one of the measures of successful avoid is how time is maximized in other words in addition to the intellect and the passions there needs to be the full accounting of time and a masculine that should give an intuitive person a uh, reason for pause. To take stock, to reevaluate, to consider or reconsider, to reanalyze every thought, speech, and deed of their entire day. And in the days, are garments, which were supposed to fill with Judaism. It's garments of Tedon, mitzvah, that we study and do each day. And these garments will eventually be the vehicles that allow us to receive godliness on the other side. And passions for God now, which is brought down from on high, with additional light. Even if one is learning Tate on the most elementary level. He may not experience at the moment passions. This Tate becomes a garment, which is it's planting seeds on high, that later on, it will later spread forward, infinite love, over the souls of Jewish people, to give them light, passions through these garments. So now there's another point. We have to serve God based on God's empowerment. And we make a vessel to receive that empowerment by doing mitzvahs and filling every moment. I will fill the number of your days. Peter. The days that we possess, Shem Levushim, are vehicles to carry light. It's incumbent upon each one of us. To make them um, whole. And then, and the number of days, and I guess the word mispas and the word sfiras, which is light which is in those days, the word sipa means to, to glow, to shine. And it means, and they should show and shine and gleam like sapphire. I have to fill every moment of my time with this light. To maximize the inspiration that we're going to get from on high. So you have to be careful to serve God with the understanding that God empowers us. And we have to fill every moment to maximize that empowerment and that access. And the last thing is, remove every kind of illness. And the Altarebbe finishes the Bible with this point, and this is the highest idea. What's an illness? A deficiency. What's the concept of an illness? The tiniest deficiency, the most theoretical deficiency. So machla means not an actual illness, but the very source of any concept of spiritual deficiency which will offset this access and this inspiration. And as much as staying away from something no good, he says, first, I removed all illness from within you. Pirush, this means the notion that an illness can attach itself to the person. What kind of illness? Not an actual sin, which is the most theoretical concept of sin. What is that? As the Talmud says, there are people who died because of the eights of the Nochash only because of Adam and Chava. They're perfect. Adam and Eve sinned, and that's why they have to die. What did Adam and Eve's sin affect? They're perfect tzaddikim. There is within them a trace of the filth that comes from the original serpent. It can't be removed altogether. That's the source of arrogance. Which is part of human nature. 
of, of Adam's nature. Bechete when he sinned, me das tevara, the hainu, which means shereye satzme, one sees himself, umake chaseni recognizes his faults, oy yedei shad tevli knows this is good for him, and he makes compromises in as much as this is concerned. In Hasidus, this is called murgash. Murgash means being in love with God, passionate about God, but noticing it. It says in Hasidus that there's a pasuk. It says the filakshia shmora uma. So it says in Chesidus from Kabbalah that the klipa in Atzilus. What's the klipa of Atzilus? Uma see my bittel, and that's machla. The most theoretical illness is just being aware of my own greatness. Kamei shvaz the pasuk says vatera isha ketev eis lamachal v'gemi. It's good to eat from the tree of knowledge. It says the alter rebbe zeh oshere shazu ama. That's the source of filth. The makel lechalat ayves. The source of all temptation, va'avedis and sin, kibeicha bezel tevaseil it all say I'm being self-centered. I'm aware of myself as opposed to God. Mashein kin kedem mechet as opposed to prior to the original sin. Hayarum they were naked. Kedixiv as the pasuk says mi yigid lachav agemet. How do you know you have clothing? Kiloi hayum margishim shurim hergish that no personal sense of awareness. Chesrei ne meitevali atzmi negative or positive for themselves. Rak only shayam asigim gilukusi is barach. They had a sense of God's truth, vidal, and that original sin introduces the theoretical illness of self-awareness, which ultimately can devolve into arrogance and self-absorption, which makes it impossible for a person to have a relationship with Hashem. And the message of the Maimit is clear. The relevance of this Maimit to us, of course, has many levels for many different people, but we all understand that the bottom line is we need God's help, not just in our material lives, but in our spiritual lives as well.